tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hi, Otis here. When you're working on projects and you're here and the rest of the team is elsewhere, do you ever feel like everyone's in the dark? It's scary stories told in the dark. The only way we can make this magic happen is remotely. Working remotely all the time can cause it fair and not so fair share of problems. And Monday.com helps solve those problems. Everything is in one place, providing a flexible platform allowing you to manage people, projects, and external tools in one easy place. The best thing about Monday.com is there's no time wasting on sync meetings, emails, or looking for an updated version. And with life the way it is these days, Monday.com keeps your team connected from anywhere. Visit Monday.com for your free two-week trial. Build confidence within your team and reach every goal with ease. Visit Monday.com to start your free two-week trial. When your teamwork is effective, nothing can stop you. To start your free 14-day trial, go to Monday.com. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 8. I'm your host, Otis Chirey, and in this episode, I'll be performing four spine-chilling tales for you, all of them from author Elias Witherow, about accused clergy, timeless terrors, nightmarish naps, and wicked winds. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight, from Ilias Wetherow, introduces us to a longtime priest who has heard many a confession in his day, but none quite like the one he's about to hear. Without further ado, I present to you the old horns. When you have been a priest for as long as I have, you start to notice patterns in people. When a parishioner approaches, I can already guess what they want to ask me by their body language, or the way their eyes flicker to meet mine. It's quite funny, actually. Everyone thinks they're unique, that somehow they're different than everyone else. Well... Let me tell you, after 38 years of hearing confessions, I've come to the conclusion that we're all pretty much identical. 
If I have to listen to one more trembling voice confess to watching pornography, I just might lose my mind. I haven't turned cynical in my old age, just weary. When you hear the same sins repeated over and over again, a thousand million times over, you begin to wonder if there's any hope left for the human race. I guess that's where faith kicks in. Though now, well, now, I'm not so sure how much of that faith I still possess. You see, I don't practice anymore. I've given up the collar. I witnessed something that has shaken me to this day, and the shadow of its memory still haunts me. It was the last confession I ever did. I stifled a yawn, trying my best to remain awake, as another sobbing parishioner left the confessional. The whole process had just become so mechanical to me that I barely even heard what was being whispered on the other side of the screen. I adjusted the cushion under my rear, feeling the familiar ache that had only gotten worse as my years advanced. I checked my watch and saw I still had another twenty minutes to go. I closed my eyes and offered it up to the Lord, begging Him to fill me with patience for these people. I heard the familiar creak of wood on the other side of the screen, as yet another sinner took their place. I ran a hand over my weary eyes and then spoke into the screen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I recited, making the sign of the cross. A male voice whispered to me from the other side, Forgive me, Father. Father, for I've sinned. This is my first confession. I shifted the cushion beneath me, annoyed at the distraction, and tried my best to focus on the man. Do not be afraid, my son. Tell the Lord what you have done. The man said nothing for a moment, his voice rasping behind the screen. Father, I don't think there's any hope for me. I've done so much. I sat up a little straighter. My son, there is no sin too great for God. The man struggled to keep his emotions in check, his voice straining. I think I've broken every rule in the book. Murder, deception, lust. The mention of murder sent a cold icicle shooting up my back. You killed someone, I asked, voice hardening. This was a serious confession, one I had never heard before in all my years in the booth. I could hear the man begin to fall apart, shame and grief washing his words in sorrow. I've killed so many people. My heart was racing in my chest. Who have you killed? When was this? The man sniffled. It was a long time ago. I've been on the run for so long. I don't know what to do anymore. My whole life is a lie. One big fake advertisement for something I'm not. I leaned into the screen, voice stern. Have you thought about turning yourself into the police? Coming clean will surely ease the weight of your sins. I can hear it in your voice, your suffering. A man started crying. You have no idea. I knew I had to be delicate here. Son, the Lord's love is endless. He can forgive you these transgressions if you show him how truly sorry you are. The man surprised me by barking a laugh. His love is not endless. I swallowed, treading carefully. I know it's hard to understand. Except, especially when you're feeling so low. But hear me. 
Nothing is too great for the Lord. His wisdom and love for you is deeper than the oceans, broader than the universe, and he wants you to know that, to feel that in your soul. The man was recovering, and he snorted behind the screen. You couldn't be <laughs> more wrong. Slightly frustrated, I pressed him. What makes you say that? Suddenly, the man's voice filled the entire booth. A deep rumble that shook me to the very core of my soul. Because I am your Lord. I blinked, my head spinning. This was new. Just what kind of person was I dealing with here? I suddenly realized that the mental state of this person could be seriously compromised. After a moment, I decided to play along a little longer. You're the Lord. I can hear you doubt, I sniffed. Well, forgive me if I'm a little cautious around someone who proclaims they're the Son of God. There is no Son of God, the man said, irritated. Just me. You guys made up all that Jesus bullshit. I had nothing to do with that. My mind was spinning as I tried to keep up. Okay, so who are you, really? And what are you doing in my confessional? The man exhaled. I just told you who I am, and I'm here to make peace before I die, or whatever happens to me afterwards. I don't really know how I die. I never thought about it before. I decided it was time to start steering the ship back on course. When a soul dies in the good graces of God, it gets sent to heaven. The man laughed. <laughs> no, no, no. You're wrong. You're all wrong. What are you talking about? I asked, feeling anger begin to stir in my chest. The man's voice dropped low. Heaven is fucking gone. I cocked an eyebrow, the seriousness in his voice giving me pause. What do you mean, gone? His tone remained the same, a low rumble. It got wiped out a long time ago. There is nothing left. For reasons unexplainable, I began to feel uneasy, a sinking dread that was just beginning to form in my stomach. How is that possible? God is almighty. The devil can never best him, I said. The man slammed his hand against the wall, causing me to jump. There is no devil. There never was. I don't know where you people got that, but it wasn't from me. There is just myself in heaven. No angels, no saints, nothing. I created a place for you, and I created a place for me. Then I sat around and watched my creations, all from the comfort of my home, my heaven. Every once in a while I'd poke my finger in and stir up some shit, cause a disaster or something, just to see how you'd react. If heaven is gone, where do our souls go when we die? I asked. I have no idea, the man said. I don't even know if you have a soul. I certainly didn't give you one. Why would I? I made you so I could have something to do. When you die, three more people will take your place, and I watch the circus go round and round. I have to say, I'm impressed with the human race. Y'all have really come a long way. I never dreamed you'd create such wonders. Something outside the booth in the sanctuary crashed, but I ignored it, the man drawing all my attention. Why, 
Why are you here? I repeated, mind blanking at the absurdity of what I was hearing. The man's voice turned quiet, an edge of unease now. Because I'm going to die soon. I can't hide down here much longer. They know where I am. They're getting so close. Who? The man collected himself before whispering. The old horns. I could hear the shuffling of feet echoing outside the booth. As people began to leave, probably annoyed at the long confessional, but I didn't care. Something about this man held me and terrified me. I am not following, I said, a worm of a knee snaking up my stomach into my chest. I thought you said there was just you and us. I thought you said the devil didn't exist. He doesn't, the man hissed. There is something else entirely. I have no idea what they are or where they came from. The logical part of me begged to end this conversation, but I couldn't let it go. What do they want with you, the old horns? Fear entered the man's voice. I don't know. They just showed up in heaven one day, taking me completely by surprise. They destroyed everything. Their power and wrath was more furious than anything I've ever seen before. I had no choice. I ran. You ran and came to Earth? I asked. I had to, he said. Where else is there to go? I don't know anywhere else but your world and mine. I have no clue where these entities came from or how they found me, but there's no stopping them. They'll be here soon. I can't hide forever. I exhaled, trying to collect my thoughts. Okay, so say hypothetically this is all true. Why would you come here to confession? If you're God, what do you need to apologize for? The man was silent for a moment and then said softly, Isn't this what? You're supposed to do before you die? Truth be told, I had no idea what will happen to me when they catch up. But I'm scared. I'm really, really scared. I've done a lot of bad things, and, and this just seemed like the right thing to do. He trailed off miserably. I'm not the all-loving, wonderful God humanity thinks I am. I've done things to you people that sicken me. I don't know why I did them, but I did. You can look back on history and probably pick out the events. I had a hand in, but pretty obvious. You know how people always say, why would God let that happen? Well, it's because I'm an asshole, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the shit I've made you people go through. You didn't deserve it. I kept pushing the envelope, and you Christians never lost faith in me. You would find ways to make sense of it all, always giving me the glory. Oh, shit, I'm so sorry. I didn't say anything, the weight of his words, collapsing in on me like the walls of a cave, trapping me in their conviction. How could I believe any of this? It was nonsense. And yet. Another crash echoed in the sanctuary, and this time I took notice because... It filled the silence. Oh, no. I heard the man whisper, fear stirring his voice. What's wrong? I asked quietly. I heard the shuffle of a curtain and then the creak of the wood. They're here. I swallowed hard. Who? The old horns. Something dropped into the pit of my stomach. And I was suddenly very on edge. I leaned forward, one hand resting on the curtain in front of me. Don't open it. Do not look at them, the man hissed. Why? I whispered my voice unsteady now. Just don't, he said urgently. My time here is done. 
I'm at the end of my road. Stay in your booth until you hear silence again. It will be safe then. This is insane, I whispered. There's nothing out there. The man leaned into the screen, his voice earnest. I know I have no right to ask you of this, but please, have faith in me one last time. My hand remained frozen, my sweaty fingers plastered to the curtain. I was paralyzed, torn between the madness of his story and the horrific sinking feeling I felt in my chest. Please, the man begged now, absolve me of my sins and I'll leave you all alone. Forever. Voice shaking, mind spinning. I released the curtain and turned to the screen. Something moved outside the booth, a scraping sound across the marble floors. I made the sign of the cross, voice trembling. I have saw a few of your sins. Go in peace. The man exhaled heavily, relief filling him. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Suddenly a noise blasted through the church, so loud I had to cover my ears, my heart leaping into my throat. It was the blast of a low horn, a long single note that rattled me to the bone. As the sound faded, a drop of sweat ran down my face. What in the hell? It's time the man said. Wait! I cried, pressing my face against the screen. Don't go out there, please! The man's voice softened. Maybe this is how it was supposed to be. I never sent someone to die on a cross for your sins. But I do love you. I love all of you. And I can't thank you enough for keeping me company all these years. You truly are an incredible people. God bless, Father. And then I heard the curtain rustle as he stepped out into the sanctuary. His footsteps echoed away from me, and I slapped my hands over my ears again as another horn sounded. My breath blew sour across my tongue, and I sat panting, waiting, sweat rolling down my spine. I heard the man speaking to something, but I couldn't understand him. His voice muffled. My hands clenched my pants, and every part of me screamed to look. But I resisted, teeth grinding together as I squeezed my eyes shut. I began to count in my head, desperately needing to focus on something. One, two, three... Four. Another ear-splitting horn sounded off. The low tone, so loud I heard the confessional booth creak against the blast. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. I opened my eyes. I had just felt something change. Something in the air. A shift in energy. A draining of something that was no longer there. I sat, panting for a few moments longer, and then let out a long breath, releasing the tension I had been holding inside of me. Cautiously, I reached out and grasped the curtain in front of me. I stood, my old bones sighing, and dragged a shaking hand across my brow. I opened the curtain and the sanctuary stood empty. Not long after that, I gave up the cloth. I just couldn't do it anymore. Something about that day shook me to the very essence of my being. I've discussed the event with a couple other priests, and they just don't understand. I don't blame them. When I recite my story, it sounds like the ramblings of a madman would alter their life so drastically based on one interaction, especially considering the circumstances. But I have, and I don't regret it. Something about prayer just feels so empty now. 
I don't know what's going to happen when I die, in truth. No one does. But what I do know is what I felt that day inside the confessional. That was real. When I strip away everything else, all the questions, the oddities, the twist in my gut is what remains. I can't explain what I witnessed. I can't rationalize the bizarre sounds I heard. I can't reenact the conviction I heard in that man's voice. But it was there, and it was real. And that is what I have put my faith into. Today's episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Monday.com. Hi, Otis here. Let me ask you something. When you're working on projects and you're here, and the rest of the team is elsewhere, do you ever feel like everyone's in the dark, not knowing what to do? Monday.com can fix that. Everything is in one place, providing a flexible platform allowing you to manage people, projects, and external tools in one easy place. And Monday.com has a free 14-day trial so you can test it out. The best thing about Monday.com is there's no time wasting on sync meetings, emails, or looking for an updated version. The entire team is working together on a shared goal. And with life the way it is these days, Monday.com keeps your team connected from anywhere. And best of all, Monday.com is easy to use, flexible, with a beautifully designed platform for teams of any size in any industry. It improves coordination between your teams and departments. You can customize it to fit a specific workflow. And with that ease comes confidence. Team members have confidence that they're focused on the work that matters most. Their work has an impact on the organization, and managers have confidence that they know exactly what's going on with their employees. And it shows the progress of your work to clients, stakeholders, or managers with easy, trackable accomplishments. There are ready-to-go templates for any use case with built-in solutions for your industry-specific workflow. Marketing, sales, CRM, construction, HR, real estate, IT, media production, and so much more. Monday.com brings your teams together so you can plan, manage, and track everything your team is working on in one centralized place. At Scary Stories Told in the Dark, I work with the members of our production team, including the show's creator, Craig Groshek, every week. And due to the fact we're thousands of miles away from each other, the only way we can make this magic happen is remotely. Now, we've been working together for six years, and I'll tell you, even at the best of times, working remotely all the time can cause a fair, and not so fair, share of problems. And it's sometimes a challenge to ensure everyone's on the same page. And back in 2014, we didn't have options like we've got now and we just did the best we could. But now Monday.com is here to help, and they've got what it takes to solve those problems and prevent them from ever getting in the way of our success again. Now we can't imagine a world without Monday.com. So if you want your team to be more effective than ever, visit Monday.com for your free two-week trial. Build confidence within your team and reach every goal with ease. Visit monday.com for your free two-week trial. When your teamwork is effective, nothing can stop you. Go to monday.com to start your free 14-day trial today. That's M-O-N-D-A-Y dot com. And let them know that Otis sent you. Thanks so much for your support of this show and our sponsors who help make my program possible. I hope you enjoyed The Old Horns, as written by Ilias Witherell and performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first story and can't quite get enough of his brand of faith-shaking fiction, you can help support our featured author by picking up a copy of their latest book, 
a horror fantasy epic entitled Outlast Your Gods, available now on Amazon. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Ilias. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash Ilias, spelled E-L-I-A-S, and you'll be redirected to Amazon, where you can explore the author's latest and his catalog of other books today. Also, as an Amazon associate, a portion of your purchase made using this URL is provided to us as well as the author. Ilias' latest, Outlast Your Gods, was just released this past August. In it, you'll meet young Rowan, lost in his head and dreaming of a life he fears he'll never have, torn between chasing his own desires and pleasing his overbearing father, Rowan struggles to find a balance as he faces the challenges of growing up. When a new couple move into the trailer next door, Rowan befriends the confidant and charismatic husband, a man named Sawyer. Unlike his father, Sawyer listens to Rowan. He listens a lot. He encourages Rowan to stand up to the town bullies and chase the girl he's been fantasizing about. There's a raw and honest edge to his advice that captures Rowan's loyalty. But as their friendship grows, Rowan begins to sense that he's on a collision course with a horrific darkness that began only as a shadow. When faced with the impossible, sometimes your only hope is to outlast your gods. Purchase your copy of Outlast Your Gods by Ilias Witherow today at simplyscarypodcast.com slash Ilias. You won't be sorry you did. And when you do, be sure to leave a five-star review and a kind word on Amazon, and let the author know you heard about him here on this show. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Up next, we've got a second tale of terror for you, courtesy once again of Elias Witherow. In it, we'll meet a person pursued by monsters that are far from ordinary, entities that transcend time itself and whose curse can only be lifted by doing the unimaginable. Without further ado, I present to you the TikTok Man. How do I even begin to tell you about the, the fucking nightmare I've been through? Give me a moment. Let me gather my thoughts. Let me prepare myself to relive the events that led me here. You're going to think I'm insane. You're, you're going to think, this isn't true. I can't say as I blame you. I still have a hard time believing any of this is real. But Jesus, the things I've seen. It's been five years now. Five confusing, hard years. You can't comprehend what I've had to go through. There's no way you'll ever know what I've been forced to surrender. You can't fathom how many things I've had to relearn. And there are still so many questions that absolutely terrify me. But I'm rambling. I told myself I was going to sit down and record everything that happened. I suppose I should start from the beginning. Christ, I don't even know where the beginning is anymore. The Watch It started with The Watch. I bought it at a flea market on the day I was going to meet Megan for the first time. I had a date with her that night. A blind date, something one of the mutual friends set up. But, but the watch, that fucking watch. Some kid was selling it at a table, along with dozens of others. They were all different, but I remember that specific one immediately caught my eye. It was made from some kind of black stone, a polished ebony band coiling around my wrist as I tried it on. It was breathtaking, a one-of-a-kind piece. The face was colored red in the center and then faded to black along the edges. The hands were colored in swirls of matching shades. The round face was encircled with beautiful shining stone, that same inky black practically glowing as I inspected it. It was heavy on my wrist, and I remember liking that. The kid, that fucking kid, 
He was watching me carefully the whole time with this glint in his eye. He knew, of course he knew. I know that now. He told me I could have it for five bucks. The price was unbeatable, and he could tell I'd fallen in love with it. I didn't hesitate, purchasing it as quickly as I could pull out my wallet. I was thinking about how it would impress my blind date. The kid snatched the five-dollar bill from my hand and started packing up his table. I didn't think anything of it, but as I turned to go, he called out to me. I turned around, expecting him to ask for more money. Instead, he had a torn look on his face. Finally, he spoke. Listen, that watch has an alarm on it. It goes off randomly. It's important you turn the alarm off before it beeps three times. Just, just trust me, okay? I remember being confused, and rightly so, I suppose. I asked the kid what would happen if I let the watch beep three times. His eyes filled with darkness. If it beeps three times, he comes. Who? The kid leans forward, whispered, his voice hoarse. The TikTok man. I think I said something rude after this reveal, brushing off the warning as some kind of immature superstition. He was just a kid, probably ten or twelve, with fears he hadn't worked out yet. I think he made me promise to remember what he said before I left. Obviously, if I had actually listened to him, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I wouldn't be telling you all this. I wouldn't have met the TikTok man. I dropped my fingers on the bar, checking the time on my brand new watch. This Megan girl was late. Not a good sign. I was fighting with my nerves and trying to come up with icebreakers so the date wouldn't fall into uncomfortable silence at any point. It was something I did for most dates, preparing a mental list of questions in case the conversation faltered. I looked around the bar, pleased with the place I had chosen to meet. It was an intimate location, the brick walls giving a cozy feel, and the candles on the table steamed the atmosphere. The interior had a high-energy vibe to it, and the tattooed bartender chatted with the patrons in a friendly fashion, making sure everyone had what they needed. It seemed like a perfect first-date spot. Every time a girl walked in, my heart would jump, expecting it to be Megan. One of our mutual friends had texted me a picture of her, and she was beautiful, out of my league. And that made me even more nervous. What was wrong with her? Why was she going out on blind dates? Why didn't she have a boyfriend? I pushed these thoughts away, irritated that my mind was already trying to talk itself out of the situation. She was probably lovely and had just gone through a slew of horrible men and wanted to try something different, something fresh. About ten minutes later, she walked in and my heart skipped a beat when I saw her. She was just as beautiful as the picture I'd seen. Flowing brown hair, bright blue eyes, and a smile that could knock you dead. I waved her over when her eyes met and she lit up. My stomach did a flip as she slid onto the bar stool next to me, and introductions were officially made. After I ordered her a drink, our conversation flowed into each other's lives, poking and prodding with genuine intrigue about who we were and what we did. She was a college student about to start her last year of school. I'd graduated the year before, and so she drilled me for tips on writing her thesis. She was fun and I liked how she always had a smile on her lips. Talking to her was easy, and the longer I sat there, the more comfortable I became. Soon, the preliminary questions faded away, and we began to just shoot the shit. It was easy, wonderfully easy, and I found myself absorbed by her. The drinks kept coming, and I soon found myself enjoying a nice buzz. I made sure I didn't say anything stupid, the alcohol pushing me to try my luck with her sexually. 
I resisted for as long as I could, but eventually I caved and began to flirt. To my surprise, she flirted back with enthusiasm. I had my hand on her thigh and a big grin on my face when it happened for the first time. Beep! Megan looked at me, a slightly tipsy grin on her face. Was that what you watch? She asked, nodding toward my wrist. I blinked my buzz away and held my watch up to my face. Well, the kid hadn't been lying about the alarm. I began fumbling for a button, some way to turn it off before it beeped again. I wasn't even thinking about the kid's warning. I just wanted to stop the annoying interruption. Beep! Am I keeping you from something? Megan asked as the watch blared out another note. My fingers finally found a small button on the side, and I pushed it, shaking my head. Uh, sorry about that. I just bought this thing. I guess someone programmed uh, an alarm on it before me. I really like it, Megan said, reaching out and taking my wrist. It's a very handsome watch. It makes you look smart. I was enjoying the way her hands felt on my skin, and I felt my heart begin to race as her fingers traced my wrist along the band. Our eyes met, and I just saw lust behind her shining blues. I swallowed hard. Did, did she want me to take her home? It's getting late, she said coyly, turning my wrist in her hands to check the time. Do you want to get out of here? Yeah, absolutely, I stammered, scrambling to remember how long ago I had purchased the condom in my wallet. Any ideas on where you want to go? Megan asked, still smiling. Well, well, I said, mind avalanching. My apartment is, well, it's trashed right now. I died a little inside as the honesty poured from my lips like vomit. She chuckled. That's okay. I'm staying with my parents over summer break, and they're gone for the weekend. So we can go to my place if you want. We have a pool. She said this last part with a wink, and I could not believe my luck. Did that mean she wanted to go skinny dipping? But that sounds great, I said, reaching into my back pocket for my wallet. I cashed us out, and we left the bar. She told me her parents' place wasn't far, about ten minutes outside of town, out in the country hills. She said I could follow her in my car, and so we parted ways momentarily. I climbed into my vehicle and let out a soft cry of victory. I couldn't believe this was happening. Who would have known things would go so well? As I followed her car out of the parking lot, I forced myself to calm down. I wasn't going to get laid if I was a nervous wreck. I had to play it cool. I had to act like it was, you know, like it was whatever. Yeah, oh, fucking Delto. I muttered to myself, but smiled just the same. I couldn't remember the last time I'd gotten laid in so easily to boot, and never with such a high-caliber girl such as Megan. I thought back on who the last girl I slept with was and what she looked like. It slowly dawned on me, and I immediately shut her face out of my mind. You had way too much to drink that night, I said out loud, shuddering. The streets were dark in the late hour, and soon I left the town behind me. My eyes trained on Megan's taillights. I rolled down the window, letting the warm summer air fill the car with electrifying possibility. I was in such a damn good mood. The full moon hung fat and yellow in the sky. I made a gun with my fingers and shot an imaginary bullet at it as the wind whipped through my hair. It felt pretty cool. Beep! Again? I thought immediately, annoyed by the noise. How often does this thing go off? No wonder that kid had been so eager to get rid of it. I fumbled in the dark interior of my car, keeping one eye on the road, as I felt for the off button. I searched for the slight incline along the side of the watch, and when my fingers made contact, I pushed it. I waited for another beep, but none followed. Not long after, I was pulling up behind Megan, a fairly large house looming before us. 
They stopped the car in the driveway and got out, appraising their home. The house was big, maybe five bedrooms, and the yard looked well kept. Everything about it boasted money. It was on a spacious plot of land, rolling green hills spanning around the sides, and I heard the gentle sway of heavy woods from the back. A bad, I stated, walking to Megan, who was getting out of her car. Uh, my dad makes pretty good money, she said, smiling. She suddenly took my hand and pulled me along after her. I didn't resist. We went around the side of the house to the back towards the pool. It was surrounded by a white fence, and Megan pulled the gate open to let us in. The water glistened in the moonlight, and I felt a shiver of excitement run through me despite the warm air. Megan went to one of the white plastic chairs that lined the sides of the pool and sat down, kicking off her heels and reaching behind to pull her shirt off. She saw me watching and grinned. Turn around, and don't look until you hear a splash. I complied, licking my lips in anticipation. This was like a dream come true. I heard her undress, and then a loud splash followed shortly after. I turned back around as her head broke the surface. The house was dark, bidding no light, but I could still see her smiling at me in the moonlight. I kicked my shoes off and pulled my shirt over my head. She watched me, waiting in the middle of the pool, eyes alight. I took my pants off, then carefully undid my watch and placed it on my pants. Even with my boxes on, I felt exposed. Behind the fence, the thick woods danced in the warm breeze as if to laugh at me. Well, come on in, Megan invited. I didn't hesitate and took a running leap into the waiting water. My breath was robbed from my lungs as the cool water enveloped me. I sputtered to the surface, gasping and wiping my eyes. Megan laughed at my obvious shock and dove underwater. I followed her lead enjoying where this was headed. We splashed around for a little while, chasing each other and laughing. I commented on how good she looked in the moonlight, and she swam closer, her glistening skin in absolute wonder. I swallowed hard as she stopped in front of me and wrapped her arms around my neck. I think I like you, she said softly, smiling. I didn't hesitate. I wrapped my arms around her and pulled her into me. I kissed her, letting the moment last, the water quietly lapping around us. It was perfect. The full moon, the dead silence, the isolation and sexually charged energy. Everything. Beep. I ignored my watch. The alarm barely registering in my mind. I pressed Megan against the side of the pool. Both of us lost in each other. Beep. Megan reached underwater and began to grope me, her hands working around my boxers. I let out a sigh and felt myself surge with desire. Beep! Megan wrapped her legs around me, and I walked us toward the pool stairs, desperate to get her up on dry land, so I could further our course of action. Our eyes met, and I could see she wanted it as much as I did. I pulled her from the water, both of our bodies rising in a rush of sound. Inside, Megan said breathlessly, come on. I didn't argue, my sex drive roaring with the intensity of a locomotive. We went to her back door and she placed her hand on the knob. A noise echoed through the night, stopping us in our tracks. It was a loud gong of a clock, and it came from the woods. We both looked at each other, the eeriness of it momentarily stalling our intentions. What was that? I asked, my view of the woods blocked by the pool's white fence. She looked back at me, and I saw she was just as confused. It sounded like an old grandfather clock, right? What the hell? I cocked my head at her. Was there a house in the woods? Because that's where it sounded like it came from. No, she said, shaking her head. There's nothing out there. It looked like she was about to say something else when the sound repeated, this time much louder. Gong! What in the world? 
I muttered, jumping at the noise. It had sounded like it was at the edge of the woods behind the fence. The kid's warning suddenly rushed back to me. Don't let it beep three times. That was ridiculous, though. What did he say would happen? The TikTok man would come? Whatever that meant. Besides, that was just some dumb story he had just made up. It was just a watch. It didn't hold any power. It couldn't summon some weird figment of imagination. This is kind of freaking me out, Megan said, huddling next to me, her shivering body dripping wet. She wasn't naked, but she might as well have been. Seeing her out of the water urged me to deal with whatever this distraction was so we could get on with it. Let me go around and take a look, I said, taking her by the shoulders. There's nothing to be afraid of. I felt a little uneasy, but I thought if I showed her how brave I was, it'd get us back on track. Megan nodded, and I went to the gate. I pushed it open and looked toward the tree line, which began at the edge of the fence. I thought I heard something making its way closer, walking along the length of the fence toward the corner in front of me. I trained my ears and felt my heart begin to thunder in my chest. There was definitely something coming. The snap of branches and foliage underfoot, announcing the arrival of whatever it was. And there was another sound I was picking up as well. It sounded like the ticking of clocks. Dozens of clocks, their passage of time, all mixing together to create a constant jumble of tick-tock, tick-tock. What the fuck? I muttered, trying to calm myself. The noise grew closer, closer. And then something walked around the corner of the fence toward me. I felt a scream rise in my throat as my eyes tried to make sense of what I was seeing. My breath drained from my lungs like air from a tire. My legs turned to liquid and yet my knees locked in place, cementing me where I stood in frozen horror. It was about seven feet tall, its black skin absorbing the moonlight around it. Its body looked human, but twisted and bent over, its movements coming in short jerks of twitching muscle. It walked on two legs like a person, but its feet were solid slabs of coned black meat. Its chest and shoulders were embedded with the glowing red circles of different sizes. As I stared, I realized that the orbs were clock faces, all burned into its tormented flesh, and slowly ticking, the source of noise made clear now. Its head was bloated and mangled, its mouth hanging limply open, its jaws swaying as it walked, held onto its face by cords of thin gold chain. It had no eyes, but instead a giant clock face filled the top half of its head with black infected skin growing around it. It glowed red in the center and then faded to black, just like my watch. The hands and the clock were in a constant twirl of chaos, spinning with no discernible meaning. And rising out of its back, in a mass of wood and flesh, was the top half of an old grandfather clock. It jutted from the creature's torn flesh, rising from its body three feet high. The weight of it pushed down on the monster, causing it to hunch over slightly. Its movement slowed. The grandfather clock was made of charred wood, tiny spires rising from its peak. The face was colored like my watch as well, but the hands held steady at midnight, a smaller third hand ticking away the seconds. I slowly backed away from the creature, never taking my eyes from it. It was about twenty feet from me, and slowly advancing, I felt a trickle of sweat run down my spine as my mind tried to make sense of the impossible figure before me. I kept expecting to blink and have it vanish, but it just kept walking towards me. Its face was trained in my direction, the large clock hand spinning madly. Its jaw swung limply from the gold chains, the blast of sparkling color, a sharp contrast to the black of its skin. The creature emitted a noise, a low growl, like the turning of gears and heavy machinery. I'd never heard anything like it before, and it chilled my bones right down to the marrow. 
It flexed its long, sharp fingers at me, the ends coming to needle-like points. As it came closer, I sensed that this entity intended me harm, that it was coming to kill me. The constant tick-tocking from its body filled the night air and seemed to count down the seconds I had left to live. I suddenly snapped from my trance-like state, the danger of my situation igniting me into action. I turned and ran, throwing the gate open and sprinting to Megan, who waited for me by the back door. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, turning my blood to fire. Megan sensed my panic as I charged her, and her eyes went wide with fear. Questions began to blossom from her lips, but I cut her off in a hurry. "'Inside! Now!' I yelled, skidding to a halt and throwing a look over my shoulder. The open gate slowed nothing but a slice of night, but I could hear the thing ticking its way closer. "'What's wrong? What is it?' Megan cried as she fumbled with the door. I didn't answer as she turned the knob, and I pushed us both in. I quickly slammed the door behind us and locked it, turning to look out of the small square window in the center of the door. I cocked my head so that I could see, and my breath froze in my lungs. It was staring right at me, its body filling the gateway. It was slowly moving its fingers as if thinking, the clock in its face glowing red. I ducked down and slid to the door, placing a hand over my beating heart. I sat with my back to the wood as Megan stood over me and peeked out the window. Her reaction was similar to mine, a sharp gasp of horrified confusion, and then she was sitting next to me, clutching me, asking me what that was. I didn't have an answer for her, so I remained silent, begging my mind to kick into gear. I needed to do something. I didn't know what this thing was or where it had come from, but I knew it wanted to kill us. I sat there, stupidly, soaking wet and in my boxers, as Megan's desperate pleas washed over me in a numb wave. I didn't know what she wanted me to do, what she expected me to do. After a few minutes of sitting in the dark, Megan slowly stood and took another look from the window. "'It's gone,' she announced breathlessly. "'It's gone!' For some reason, her words didn't comfort me. She might not be able to see it, but it surely wasn't gone. Why didn't you listen to that kid? I thought. Why didn't you just turn off the stupid alarm? I knew in retrospect that it was easy to blame myself, but realistically, why should I have believed the kid's warning? We don't prepare for the impossible because it's just that. The impossible. I slowly stood, the house silent. I looked around, and in the dim darkness, I could see we were in the basement. At the far end of the room, a staircase led up to a closed door. I turned and took a quick look through the window and saw nothing but calm night. We need to get out of here. Megan whispered urgently. I know, I know. I said, running my fingers through my hair. Just let me think. My thoughts were cut short when a loud noise exploded upstairs above us. Jesus Christ, I whispered. Did it just kick in the front door? Megan's eyes were wide, and I felt her hand grip my arm. Suddenly, the basement door erupted in a violent burst of splinters, the wood fragments rocketing down the stairs toward us. Megan let out a scream as the tick-tock man filled the dark doorway. The clocks that were fused into its skin gave off a soft red glow, washing his skin with haunting color. The grandfather clock on its back was too tall for him to fit in the stairway, and so it slowly got on its hands and knees and began to crawl down towards us. Megan was clawing at me, screaming for me, but I just stood and watched in horror as it slid down the stairs, the basement filling with the sound of a dozen ticking clocks. It reached the end of the stairs and stood back up, not ten feet from us. My heart was a block of ice in my chest, and my legs felt sluggish and heavy as I begged them to move. Air hissed between my dry lips, and my throat burned with an effort to breathe. As the tick-tock man stood, I noticed the time on the grandfather clock had advanced. 
Instead of midnight, the hands read 1215. I didn't know if it meant anything, and my brain was too scrambled to try. Get away from us! Megan was screaming. She turned and grabbed the door behind us, fumbling in the dark trying to unlock it. Just as I heard the click of her successful attempts, the monster before us moved. I expected it to rush us, but instead it gripped its own throat and pushed its head back. The clock hands on its body began to spin faster, and the red color in the center of each of them began to glow brighter. Suddenly, noise erupted from its mouth, a deafening blast of sound. Gong! 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 I slammed my hands over my ears and saw Megan do the same, the volume of its chimes aching in my ears. I felt like my head was going to split, and I squeezed my eyes shut against the blasts. I felt myself growing weak, the black behind my eyelids swimming in and out of focus. Something was happening to me. The gonging kept going, each note followed quickly by another, the offensively loud sound cracking my skull open and rattling my brain. I felt like my head would pop, unable to take the shock waves of pain with each toll. And then suddenly, it stopped. My head rocked with agony and I clutched my temples, eyes still shut. I felt the world shimmer and then refocus around me. Slowly, I opened my eyes. Something was wrong. The proportions of everything was off. The furniture and ceiling loomed overhead. I felt dizzy and I stumbled as I took in this contorted reality. No, it wasn't reality that had shifted. It was me. I looked down at my body and felt panic roar in my chest like a screaming inferno. I was young again. I looked at my hands and little legs, testing my weight in a hurried attempt to acquaint myself with this new horror. I couldn't be more than two years old. But my mind remained the same. I was trapped in a younger version of myself, and as I opened my mouth to speak, nothing but a choked, gurgling sound came out. It was like the words became garbled as they rose from my throat, distorted by the inexperience of youth. I turned my head and saw Megan had suffered the same fate. Big tears rolled down her face, as she stared at me in absolute disbelief. We were toddlers, shrunk back down as our years were taken back from us. Broken syllables and sounds poured from her mouth as she tried to speak to me, but I couldn't understand any of it. We were trapped inside younger versions of ourselves, our minds held captive in underdeveloped bodies. Suddenly, the TikTok man was towering above us. He looked terrifyingly huge from where I stood, my neck craning to take in his looming form. Megan screamed, her voice a high-pitched wail, and she scrambled to get away. She stumbled and fell, unaccustomed to the way her body worked. She struggled to pull herself upright, and I saw her arms quivering with effort, and then it hit me just how defenseless we were right now. The danger, suddenly horrifyingly real, I took off in the opposite direction, away from Megan, away from the monster. My little feet took me across the room toward the couch, where I ducked and hid. My muscles already ached from effort, and I sucked in big breaths, trying to fill my lungs with oxygen. I couldn't believe how weak I was, how easily I tired. I heard Megan screaming, and I got down on all fours and crawled under the couch. I peeked through the skirt on the other side and saw the TikTok man bending down to pick Megan up. He clutched her in one hand, his long, sharp fingers wrapping around her head, and lifted her squirming body from the floor. In one quick motion, it twisted her head and pulled it from her shoulders with a sick, popping sound. Blood splashed to the ground, and Megan's cries were cut short 
as she was forcefully decapitated. I felt bile charge up my throat, the horrific scene slamming into my senses, and I vomited onto the floor. The creature turned my way, and I noticed that the hands on the grandfather clock now read 12.30. I hurriedly scooted backward, hiding myself under the couch's skirt. I held my breath, eyes squeezed shut as tears leaked from them. I rubbed a chubby hand against my nose, wiping away snot, begging to turn invisible. Suddenly, the couch flew off me, tossed aside by the enormous monster. I screamed, my underdeveloped vocal cords vibrating in a high shriek. I scrambled to get away, but my sluggish muscles wouldn't react fast enough. I saw it swing its long, sharp hand at me, and I ducked, desperately trying to avoid the same fate as Megan. I wasn't fast enough, and I took the impact across my shoulders. Pain splintered through my body, and I went airborne, soaring through the room and into the window. I crashed through it and went tumbling into the night air, landing hard in the pool area, the rough cement unforgiving on my skin. I came to a stop by the pool's edge, and lay gasping, my breath beaten out of me. Everything hurt, and jolts of sharp pain coursed along the left side of my small body. My legs and knees were bleeding, leaving red streaks on my vulnerable flesh. I blinked back darkness, forcing myself to keep my eyes open. I knew that if I closed them, I would never open them again. In a daze, I saw the TikTok man climb through the shattered remains of the window, ducking down to allow the grandfather clock access to the outside. It read 1245. That can't be right, I thought numbly. The hands are moving too fast. And then another thought drifted up from my scattered mind. Maybe time is different where it comes from. I forced myself to get up my body, screaming in protest. I realized that I was crying, my cheeks wet with tears. Move, I told myself. You have to move or you're dead. Crying out, I hobbled toward the open gate, the last-ditch effort to get away from the murderous monster. It had pulled itself completely from the window when it spotted me, pathetically limping toward the open gate, a look of utter terror on my face. I wasn't moving fast enough. He's going to rip your head off, I thought, tears flowing from my eyes. You have to do something. I suddenly turned around, hearing the creature close behind me. My body in shambles, I dashed where I had left my clothes, my shoulders screaming in protest. My legs felt like they were on fire, and every time I exhaled, blood and drool flew from my lips. I reached the chair I'd left my clothes and snatched the watch from where I'd left it. I turned it around holding it out in front of me like a shield. The TikTok man froze, mere feet from me, the sight of the watch freezing it in its tracks. I had no plan, no hope, just a prayer and a dying wish. We stood staring at each other, neither one of us moving. For some reason, the sight of the watch kept it frozen in place. The black stone it was made from felt hot in my hands, and I gripped it tighter, I didn't know what kind of power it had over this entity, but I slowly backed up, keeping the watch held out in front of me. I never took my eyes from it, circling around the pool, waiting for the creature to suddenly lurch into motion. But it remained where it stood, slowly turning to watch me as I came around the far side and slowly made my way to the gate. I could hear a mechanical growl coming from deep in its chest, a roaring anger, a deep hunger. I got to the gate and glanced out, my eyes going to the tree line. I had to try and make it. It was my only hope. I turned and ran, going as fast as my broken body could take me. As soon as the watch broke contact with the monster, I heard it howl, the sound echoing in the night like clanging chimes. I knew it wouldn't be far behind me, and I begged my clumsy body to move faster, trying my best to ignore the agony it was in. My bare feet shuffled through the grass, the tree line seeming impossibly far away. 
A breeze rustled the treetops, and I heard the TikTok man explode through the fence behind me. The earth vibrated under my feet as I felt it take long strides toward me, but I dared not look back. Suddenly, I fell, my body simply giving up. I crashed to the ground with a cry, the watch flying from my hands. I hit the dirt with a grunt, and a new wave of pain gripped me. I grit what teeth I had and began to crawl toward the trees, my tiny fists grabbing handfuls of dewy grass. I knew I was dead. Suddenly, I felt a strong hand grip my ankle, and I was lifted into the air. I dangled upside down, screaming, as the TikTok man pulled me up. Its form was hideous up close, its skin reeking and giving off a nauseating heat. I battered at it with a powerless fist, yelling and howling. It gripped my head with its other hand, and I was flipped upright, dangling from its grip in a helpless heap. This was it. It growled with pleasure, a rumbling turning of gears, and I waited for the end. I closed my eyes. Gong! I snapped my eyes open. The sudden sound unexpected and deafening. I blinked and saw that the grandfather clock on its back had struck one. Suddenly the TikTok man went into a rage, thrashing its arms about, its dozens of clocks exploding in red color. The hand spun at an increased speed, and I was tossed to the ground. I landed in the grass, wincing and letting out another cry as I came to a stop. I turned my head and saw another impossibility. Gold chains snaked out of the grandfather clock like coils of a hundred snakes. They moved on their own accord, sliding around the TikTok man's flesh, wrapping themselves in tight knots, binding him. The monster screamed in rage, furious that it had been mere seconds away from killing me. The chains continued to snake out from its back, covering its body in layers and layers of dense gold. In a matter of seconds, the creature was completely enveloped by its bindings, and I watched in horrific fascination as the cluster of gold began to shrink. I expected flesh and blood to come squirting from the chains, but they remained spotless and shining in the moonlight. The howls from the monster never ceased as the chains seemed to shrink on themselves, the mass growing smaller and smaller until finally... The nightmare simply winked out of existence. I lay there in the grass, my breath coming in burning gulps, unable to believe what I had just witnessed. Blood pulsed in my ears, and my heartbeat was a desperate drumbeat. I closed my eyes and let the darkness take me. It's been five years since now. I survived that bloody night, though. I don't know how. My body was a mangled mess, and I had to do intense rehab ever since. In a stroke of pure blessing, Megan's parents came home early from out of town. When they saw the broken glass and the blood, they called the police. And then they found the headless body of their daughter, reduced unexplainably back to her early years. I wasn't conscious for any of this. The police found me laying in the grass when they arrived. I was rushed to hospital, and by some miracle, I survived. When I woke up, when I woke up in the hospital, I rubbed my eyes and felt something heavy on my wrist. The watch. Somehow, I was wearing that fucking watch. You see, I can't get rid of it. No matter how hard I try, no matter what I do, when I fall asleep, I wake up wearing it again. I've tried smashing it, burying it, burning it, but nothing works. It always returns, looking brand new. I've thought back to when I bought it from that kid, and I wonder if the only way to, to pass this curse off me is to sell it to another unlucky soul. I thought about it. Oh, have I thought about it. But no matter how much I hate this, how much this monstrous thing has destroyed my life, it is, in fact, my burden to bear. I can't pass this off to someone else. I can't give them the horror I know will come. 
Because you see, the alarm still goes off. It's random, completely unpredictable. Sometimes months will pass, and it will remain silent. Other times it will go off three times in one day. There's no pattern or reason for it. It's a monster of its own makings. I fear going to sleep, afraid that if it goes off in the middle of the night, I won't hear it. I'm afraid the TikTok man will come back and finish the job, summoned by the watch on the third chime. So now it is a part of me, this goddamn watch. I've learned to live with it as best I can, but the fear won't go away. I don't think it ever will. Because I know, I know that one day I won't turn the alarm off in time. I know that it's going to come back for me. And I have a lot of years ahead of me. I'm seven years old now. I'm seven years old again. I live in a foster home, a quiet outcast who just wants to be left alone. The family I'm with are good people, but they don't understand the weird things I say sometimes. And how could they? I'm a 28-year-old trapped in a 7-year-old body. And let me tell you, living through life again is not something I would wish on anyone. Life, it's full of monsters waiting to rip you apart over and over and over again. I hope you enjoyed The TikTok Man by author Elias Witherow, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author has an amazing collection of stories for sale on Amazon.com, including collections of his short tales as well as several longer works. Earlier we mentioned Elias' latest, Outlast Your Gods, But before we go, I'd like also to personally recommend his thrilling dystopian sci-fi novel, Final Sky, released this past January. In Final Sky, you'll visit a dying world in which a mysterious disease known as rock flesh is rapidly spreading throughout the lands, turning men into monsters. Humanity seeks answers in an existence that's barely surviving. At the base of such mysteries lies The Chain, a massive construct that holds the world suspended above the void. Some believe the creator holds the end of the anomaly. Others doubt. Liam, a mercenary leading a small group of warriors, is hired to take a stranger named Resin to The Chain. The task is daunting and surrounded by questions, but these are desperate times. When their journey begins, a rumor of a madman spreads. A man named Desmond, who seeks to destroy the chain and plunge the world into the void below. As Liam and his small group battle through the nightmare-plagued lands, the answers to the world's mysteries begin to unravel. Who is Desmond? Why is he so hell-bent on severing the world from its stem? What caused the disease known as rock flesh? And what's really up there, past the chain, beyond the rolling ceiling of the cloud. There's only one way to find out, by picking up a copy of Final Sky by Ilias Witherow today from Amazon in either the paperback or Kindle editions. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Ilias, spelled E-L-I-A-S. Once more, that's simplyscarypodcast.com slash Ilias, and you'll be redirected to Amazon where you can get started giving yourself the creeps today. And again, if you give any of Ilias' works a try, please leave him a quality review and a kind word, and be sure to let him know you heard about him here on this program, and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. You can learn more about him by following him on Facebook, Twitter, or Reddit. Just search for him by name. Ilias Witherow. I'd also like to take a moment to thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, 
please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can purchase a season's pass for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014, and you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>